Tonight, we are deeply honored to have back in our orbit, Margaret Randall, celebrating the launch of two new books, Thinking About Thinking from Casa Uraca Press and Out of Violence into Poetry from Wings Press. Margaret Randall is a feminist poet, writer, translator, photographer, and lifelong social activist. She is the author and editor and translator of nearly 200 books and has received numerous honors for her work. She is the recipient of the 2019 Hedi Santa Maria Medal from Casa de la Americas in Havana, as well as the prestigious two, uh, Poet of Two Hemispheres Prize, as well as the George Garrett Award from AWP. She's also the first recipient of the Penn New Mexico Dorothy Doyle Lifetime Achievement Award for writing and human rights activism. Amongst an extensive list of other additional honors, Ms. Randall has lived for extended periods of time around the world from Albuquerque to New York, Seville to Mexico City, Havana to Managua and beyond. Her published work include To Change the World, My Life in Cuba from Rutgers University Press, More Than Things, University of Nebraska Press published. Uh, her most recent nonfiction work includes Only the Road, Et Decades of, poetry, of Cuban Poetry from Duke University Press. Also, Exporting Revolution, Cuba's Global Solidarity from Duke University Press, amongst many, many others. Joining her tonight in conversation is City Light's very own Garrett Caples. Garrett is the poetry editor of City Light's Books, where he curates the Spotlight Poetry Series. He is a remarkable poet in his own right, having authored numerous volumes of work. Uh, he has a new uh, work coming up in October. We're actually going to be featuring him in an event with Cedar Sego on October the 12th. So please check out our calendar for that. Margaret Randall, Garrett Caples, welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Thank you, Garrett, also for accompanying me tonight. And uh, it's just great to be back at City Lights, even though of course, virtually these days. Um, so one of my new books, Thinking About Thinking, is a collection of short essays. Not quite essays is how the publisher describes them. This is what the book looks like. Um, and uh, they cover, the essays cover a range of topics important to us these days. Uh, for example, Me Too, the dilemma in getting rid of insulting statues, how uh, technology intersects with art, whether there is such a thing as political poetry. Um, and, and so um, the essays are, are personal, they're political, uh, but some of the most political, I guess, are also some of the longest. So um, I've, not, I've chosen not to read any of them here. I'd like to read one essay and then uh, some poems from the other book. Um, You'll have to order the book uh, to read the longer essays, and I hope you do. And I hope you do it through um, City Lights because, um, as I'm sure all of you know, this is a bookstore that has battled for decades to uh, remain in service to those of us who love books and love working, uh, love reading good literature, not uh, what the the um, the the big uh, corporate publishers and corporate bookstores would have us read. Um, so I'm gonna read uh, one of the essays that particularly relates to books and bookstores and, and publishing. It's called Farewell to the Book. A few years back, a friend wrote to tell me her, no her novella had been published. Where can I get a copy? Here's the link, she responded. When I went there, I discovered her book was only available on Kindle, no hard copy at all. This was my first experience with what has since become commonplace, a gradual replacement of physical books with their digital imposters, something like cloning in a minor key. Call me old fashioned. I like to read real books, material objects with pages I can turn, a cover that draws me in, ink letters that in some cases even bear a faint whiff of the centuries old bookmaking craft. I know it's the rare book today that was produced on a letterpress with anything resembling printer's ink, but the mass produced facsimiles 
especially when well-designed, allow me to make believe. Reading is, after all, often about make believe. It transports us to distant lands, times before our own or in the future, people with whom we would not come in contact were it not for their stories preserved in print, ideas that agonize or delight us, answers to questions we didn't know we had. I know that the electronic versions of books, the Kindle, Apple books, the Nook, deliver the same content. They, do, they even do so much more expediently. Instead of lugging a heavy trunk, you can travel with several hundred titles inside a small handheld device. You can make the typeface larger or smaller, change the background from white with black letters to black with white letters or varying shades of gray, depending on your eyesight or light source. And by clicking on a word or phrase, you can explore its history and meaning with dictionaries, thesauruses, and encyclopedias that enrich the experience. But something doesn't feel right. It may be about the way form and content merge for me when the vehicle delivering them is what I expect. From ancient papyrus scrolls to contemporary paper pages bound in elegant cloth, the physical characteristics of books have traveled, has traveled a rich history. Compare writing in the margins with making digital notes. Consider the touch of a cloth, leather, or even paper cover as opposed to the cold feel of a digital device. Imagine what their material essence said of papyrus scrolls, cuneiform engravings, glyphs etched into stone, or the codices of the Maya. Surely their material form was as important as the content that can be read there. And we have a sumptuous tradition of artist books, one of a kind objects with their own stories to tell, curling up in the corner of a comfortable couch against a pile of cushions on a cold winter night almost demands a real book in a hand. I understand all the advantages offered by the digital devices, but give me an old fashioned book. Is it just that at my age, I'm not comfortable with progress? No, I traded my old film camera in for a digital model. I miss my dark room, but became proficient at Photoshop when the time came. I use a cell phone and even got rid of my landline. The coronavirus pandemic pushed me to learn digital platforms in order to perform my work virtually. I do a great deal of research online and depend on email to connect me to the world. This begs the question of digital periodicals. Why do I value them when digital books disappoint? I think it must have to do with the fact that I expect a periodical to be constantly changing of the moment, immediate and relevant to the here and now. Digitally delivered news media allow for community response, sometimes even blossoming into full-blown discussion. But books are where I draw the line. I hope I do not live long enough to have to say farewell to books. Could it be because I'm a writer and although I appreciate my publishers making my words available on all the different platforms, I welcome each new physical book as if it were a newborn. From cover through interior format, I delight in what their designers do with the raw material I provide. I'm always eager to see how they match their talents to mine, producing something elegant and inviting so that readers may delight in the experience. I've been fortunate in this respect Bryce Milligan, 
the wonderful editor at Wings who designs and produces my poetry collections has given me great gifts, particularly with a handbound limited edition of As If the Empty Chair, Como La Silla Vacia, my suite of poems for Latin America has disappeared and Time's Language, my selected poems from 59, 1959 to 2018, chosen from 31 of my poetry collections. Duke University Press, where I've been publishing my nonfiction books, outdid itself with volumes such as Only the Road, Solo el Camino, Eight Decades of Cuban Poetry, and my memoir, I Never Left Home, Poet, Feminist, Revolutionary. For a companion vol volume, My Life in a Hundred Objects, I looked for a publisher I knew would be able to reproduce the hundred images in full color. I was thrilled when New Village Press took the project on and it too is a gorgeous object. So I've been fortunate to have had many foreign editions of my work over the years, beautifully designed in Mexico, Ecuador, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, Venezuela, Chile, Holland, Turkey, and Japan, among other countries. Different countries have different bookmaking traditions and styles. I love the book flap many of these editions use, and that has all but gone out of style in the United States. And because I love books, I love bookstores, especially the independent variety that enriched our communities before the chains did them in and now exist in vastly reduced numbers. I can spend hours in those wonderful places staffed by people who know and love books. I never feel rushed or as if I were in some wholesale warehouse. I understand that those stores stock titles by publishers specializing in women's books, Latin American titles, and experimental literature. I know that the major publishers give preferential pricing to the chains. Our country's taste in reading is subtly but conclusively being shaped to reflect the needs of a corporate, consumerist, violent, and warmongering society. They would turn us into pawns in their system. Independent publishers and independent booksellers seem a last line of defense. The invasion of the national chains went hand in hand with governmental defunding of libraries and schools cutting art and music so that students could spend all their time learning to take tests and spew names and dates from memory. Teaching to think has been replaced with rote memorization. The United States world standing in innovation, creativity, and how well we educate our young has suffered as a result. And our experts still don't seem to grasp the reason why. As the past century waned, the city of Albuquerque with fewer than a million inhabitants had the living batch for decades, one of the best literary bookstores in the country. It had sold of the earth, a marvelous general interest store that also hosted years of important readings and lectures. We had Full Circle, one of the best stocked women's bookstores, and then also Sisters and Brothers, a store featuring gay and lesbian literature. Trespassers William was a store where children could attend weekly storytelling sessions and find the perfect book for whatever age and taste. Each of these great stores eventually succumbed to the pressure of capitalist bookselling. Today, we have only Bookworks, Page One, and Organic Books, too few in a city of our size to make up for those we've lost. A few years after the demise of so many fine independent bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, Noble and Borders, the chains that had done them in, had to face competition from Amazon.com, the mega online source for everything from books to appliances. The chains then too 
became victims of these changing times. Amazon is a phenomenon with which it's hard to argue. I hate the corporate power it exerts over publishing and pricing, how authors and independent publishers are overlooked or exploited and the sensationalist titles that it features. I hate watching a single powerful en entity control how we acquire our food for thought. At the same time, I appreciate a single site where new and used editions can be found, where at least some of the savings are passed on to the buyer and where readers can review and recommend books. I appreciate my own Amazon authors page, listing so many editions of my titles over the years. In capitalism, progress too often means less attention is paid to issues of originality, craft, or the pride in making something beautiful. Mass production brings costs down and makes items more widely available, although most of what is saved goes into industry's pockets, leaving the consumer with little remedy or protection. Much more dangerous and less discussed is the fact that when corporations control production, they also fabricate need, encouraging public interest in what benefits big business. Getting a public population to buy what, what will make it less able to think for itself and to be more dependent on what the corporate bosses are selling is an important part of the picture. My attachment to the physical book may be a last gasp act of defiance, reminiscent of a different time, one in which independent thinkers could more easily start a small press and publish texts that would never have made it past the gatekeepers at Random House or Simon & Schuster. A time when I could call my independent bookseller and ask her to order a title that caught my fancy or browse among bookshelves stocked with the unexpected the rebellious, the magical. Yes, I think it is one woman's small statement, memory honored and unleashed. It's not about rejecting progress or failing to keep up with the times. I do all right in those areas. It's my own personal monument to the integrity of the word on the page, palpable, vicarious experience free from, from consumerist coercion. So that's a taste of the sort of essay you'll find in thinking about thinking. I want to say that Zach Hively at Casa Uraca Press in Northern New Mexico is another one of those rare spirits who cares about books and produces them in beautifully designed editions. Rafael Mondragon of Heredad in Mexico has translated this book into Spanish. It'll be released in that country in early November in time to be launched at the Guadalajara Book Fair. And I'm celebrating tonight another book, um, a collection of poems. Uh, it's this one and um, it's called Out of Violence into Poetry. This book is also available in a bilingual uh, Spanish-English edition already from Ediciones Moneda in Chile. This is what the Chilean uh, edition looks like. And the um, cover art is by my wife, Barbara. Uh, the director of the press, Carmen Avendano, did the translation and designed a beautiful book and she Chilean poet Carmen Berenger and I will launch the edition virtually on September 15th. So I'll post the Zoom coordinates on my Facebook page. And now here are a few po of the poems from Out of Violence into Poetry. The first one is called Lifetime Warranty. Age brings wear and tear to body parts. And I imagine a shop where replacements are shelved by date and model. The experimental or mass produced on special sales tables, 
as if daring us to try a plastic nose immune to sun damage or super batteries for heart or liver guaranteed to last forever. Generic models would attract the low income shopper, luxury versions, the elite who have everything but a perfect working body. The place itself might be an upscale boutique or big box store where everything go, everyone goes for bargains. No remedies yet for serious cancers, dementia, or flesh eating bacteria. Short term solutions are advertised in glowing terms and offered on brightly decorated racks right next to the cashier. They just may get you on the way out and there is no layaway. Portable oxygen and tropical flavors is this month's special. No shortage of deception when hope stretches thin. I imagine visiting such a futuristic shop, boutique or basement, a bargain basement, and know it's a first world dream. Desperate people the world over sell their body parts, hair and kidneys, or use their organs to carry contraband. If lucky, they may get enough to eat a few more months or a fleeting chance at another day. What would a lifetime warranty mean to a body wearing only hope? Will the consumer hold out for designer DNA or invest in replacement body parts? How can those who sell a piece of themselves be sure a sliver of spirit or strand of character isn't lost in that deal of last resort? Privilege roams the first world while elsewhere survival comes at tragic cost. This poem is called My Beginnings and Endings. My beginnings and endings cower within, hiding in groves of limping muscle braving the rapids on rivers of blood or huddled on islands of fat. They are fearful they may be seen, taken at face value or forced to stand guard as mileposts on back roads, not marked on any map. But the real problems come when an end tries to pass itself off as a beginning, confusing the me who observes as if from afar, when I am part of the equation, my memory struggling to reimagine parts worn through years of indecision. That moment, I should have said no, or cried a full-throated yes, as time saw origins wither, almost die, then rise again, conclusion too often riding on their broken wings. This one is called, We Won't Take Yes for an Answer. We tell them no means no and ask what part of that word they don't understand every secret place on the far side of casual conversation disappears after the fire sale. I would tell you, read my lips, but fear being taken for a president boasting mission accomplished. There is no mission here, just vulnerability donning its invisibility cloak of shame. We tell them no means no. They smile disarmingly, 
we won't take yes for an answer and turn them into pillars of salt. This next one is called Tongue Seeking Solace. And it's for my friend Roberto Tejada as I pondered his wonderful book, Still Nowhere in an Empty Vastness. A word is uttered. Its echo dances through time and cannot be taken back. Its silhouette expands across this map, filling every secret corner. Breath explodes against rock. Early morning dew beads upon your lip. You taste salt as your tongue seeks solace between your teeth. This word was meant to follow in the wake of that. Feeling remains the better part of mind. We grab as much as we can hold. Ancestors drag us back in Cuenta Regresiva from that stone notch where the sun's dagger meets a future we do not dare to dream. Can we inhabit simultaneity of time and place Imagine parting the waters one more time to reach where we have been. And I think I'll end with the book's title poem, Out of Violence into Poetry. Water, real or illusory, shimmers along a desert horizon. Oasis, early 17th century word via late Latin from the Greek, perhaps of Egyptian origin. Egypt, a country with vast desert on which wet and fertile exceptions nourish life. Also peaceful area or period in the midst of a troubled place or situation. Thus, place becomes time in the blink of geography's eye. Embracing one another, they rise in our throats as one seesaw of intuition, grabbing control. Let me satiate your thirst, feed your hunger, satisfy mine, if only because we are conscious beings standing together in this dangerous century. We are reduced to small gestures reflected in a gaze, the touch of a hand, cases of light where we may move, oases of light where we may move out of violence into poetry. Thank you. So now if, uh, if you're ready, Garrett, let's yes, start. Yes, yes. Thank you, Margaret. That was really great. <clears throat> great to hear new poems. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, oddball questions I maybe wanted to start with uh, on the subject of poetry, uh, because uh, you're, the poem, some of the poems you read made me think of this. Um, Particularly lifetime warranty, and this is this is out of out of left field. But what do you do? You ever think of yourself as a surrealist? <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a real surrealist quality to some of your imagination. So I just that's why I'm asking, like, not as a card carrying, you know, member, but you know. Oh, I don't think of myself as a card carrying member of anything. Maybe yeah. a heart carrying member. Um, you know, I, it's an interesting question because I, I never have thought of myself as a surrealist, but I kind of understand where you're coming from, where the question is coming from, because, um, you know, I lived so many years in Latin America, and I think that the magic realism um, of literature and of life in Latin America is um, 
is is really a part of my work. It's 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 a part of my life, and so of course it's a part of my work. And there is a relationship, of course, between uh, magic realism and surrealism. So yeah. um, maybe that's that's sort of where I get where I come on to that is um, is on the magic realism side. Yeah, because would would you say there's like there's there's more there's more of a tendency in say Latin American literature than American literature in general uh, or U.S. literature of um, of there being this kind of perme permeability between the real and the unreal. Yeah, yeah. imaginably. Th that's true, you know, but as um, I remember a friend of mine in Mexico uh, in the 60s who was really a great surrealist painter, Leonora Carrington. And oh, no. uh, those of, you know, those who know her work know what I mean. I mean, her, her work was filled with these uh, surreal figures, magical figures and so forth. And I think perhaps I find um, the magic more sort of an everyday uh, connections and uh, and uh, people and places and events. Um, so I don't, I can't remember ever going in my work to those, you know, truly surreal uh, areas of imagery at least. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like surrealism in the ordinary way we imagine that with poetry, you know, but there is a sort of, there is a kind of surreality to the imagination of like this department store, say, in a limited warranty where you're shopping for uh, for limbs and stuff. Yeah, I guess so. And actually, um, that particular poem is kind of one of my rare efforts to imbue my, my poetry with some humor, because although the poem isn't ultimately humorous, really, but, you know, I'm, I, I berate myself often because my poetry, um, you know, comes from life and it, it's pretty dark a lot of the times. Uh, and yet I am basically a pretty optimistic person and I have a wonderful family and wonderful friends and children and great grandchildren and great grandchildren. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who lives uh, a suffering life by any means, but I do recognize the tragedies that are being afflicted upon us by, um, you know, this predatory capitalism that we're living in. And um, so, um, you know, I think that poem in particular was sort of an effort to, to make people smile, if not laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, not to belabor this, but I just, just, uh... It's just been occurring to me here and there also because you seem to draw on the dream a lot, you know, like I, I read your short stories recently and a lot of those stor short stories are situated in dreams, you know, or, or that there's a dream is a central plot uh, part of those stories. Yeah, it's true. I do dream a lot. And uh, I also have many nightmares. Um, my dreams are, are not all a lot of fun. Uh, and so, um, you know, when I wake up, uh, the dream is very often still there and, um, you know, I just can't get rid of it. And so sometimes it does find its way into my writing or a poem or an essay or, or a short story. Um, the collection of short stories that I just finished um, really does, as you say, have uh, a lot of dream time in it, but I, I think of it more as the as dream time in the in the connotation of um, the um, the Aboriginal peoples uh, of Australia, the kind of uh, dream time that isn't only uh, or or specifically um, happening in the night, but is something that accompanies us, uh, you know, in our in our waking lives. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, again, it's a kind of indicating the permeability between these things that are usually set up as opposites. Uh, okay. Well, let me switch gears then poetically and ask you this. Uh, I was um, I was looking at a poem you sent us for that uh, magazine that we just published. Uh, and, uh, you know, I gave, gave the magazine to my friend Julian and he, he read the whole thing over a couple of days and got back to me. And the thing that, the bit that he really liked that struck him the most on the first uh, perusal was the second stanza of your poem, where you have you have this image of uh, 
uh, filling a chamber of bullets with uh, with uh, babies about to be born, you know, and just just how how uh, he was really um, hit with that image, you know, and it 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 led us to a whole discussion of um, how your your poetry what you really like to end poems with a bang. You know, like, you know, the title of this collection even is the last line of the poem in which it appears. And I'm, I'm curious about this because, you know, my friend Julian, this is Julian Poirier, another uh, poet friend of ours, but uh, Julian and I grew up in a sort of poetic milieu where um, it was kind of frowned on to have like a really strong ending, you know, that, that it was, uh, you know, that you, you know, things would happen and you kind of just wander off or something. And, you know, you clearly never got this memo that, uh, <laughs> that, that you're not supposed to end, end with bags. So I just, I wanted to ask you about that because it really reminds, reminded us of like Yates or something, you know, the way that like all the memorable stuff in Yates would be like the last two or three lines of a poem. Well, I, I got the memo. Uh, I uh. did get the memo, but I tend to ignore memos. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I know the rules, uh, but I don't like the rules. You know, sometimes yeah. they work and sometimes they don't. I think that um, for many years in my poetry in particular, uh, one of my fa failings was um, that my poems would go on too long. You know, they would have a few extra lines that just didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. And uh, often, sadly, after publishing them in a magazine or even a book, I would say, I'd reread the poem and I'd say, oh my God, I should have stopped that poem, uh, you know, three lines sooner or a whole stanza sooner. So I think I'm aware of that for that reason that um, because, um, you know, I've had that failing in some of my work, it's very important for me to leave the reader or the listener with the real message that I'm trying to put across or the feeling that I'm trying to put across. It's not always a message. Yeah. And, uh, so I think, you know, maybe maybe that explains a little bit why I pay a lot of attention to the endings of poems. I hope I'm doing better in that respect than I used to. Oh, they're great. I mean, the, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes too, when you're writing a poem, it needs to cool for a while before you you, you really understand where it should end, you know, <laughs> that that uh, it's when you when you've just, if you publish it too quickly after you write it, you know, you, you things like what you say happens where you're like this this uh this could have ended here and it would have been right. a stronger poem and if you're 85 you know a lot of that stuff has already happened and you just have to live with it so you know yeah. <laughs> i accept that i accept that uh, now are, when so when you write, write them though are, are the ending are the endings uh hard hard fought to achieve or do they just come i mean you know like a striking line like out of violence into poetry like how how spontaneous versus how uh, worked is that? I, I think it's it's pretty spontaneous. I think that the ending of the poem, which in my mind is sort of the core of the poem or the, the backbone of the poem, yeah. is, is pretty much there for me when I start the poem. And these days I rewrite a lot. Um, I go over poems a lot and I change them. And sometimes it's just a comma. Sometimes it's several words or lines. Um, but I think that the, the way I want the poem to end, which again is the feeling that I want the reader or listener to have uh, after experiencing that poem, I think that that's sort of there to begin with. And what my process is, is to work until that happens, until I feel that, that you know, that I've been able to do that. Does any of that sometimes come... Uh... Does any of the sounds come before the words sometimes or? Sure. For you? sure. Yeah. And very often the images come before the words as well. Um, mm. I have the great good fortune to live with a woman who's a wonderful um, visual artist. And, um, you know, we've been together for almost 35 years now. And so, you know, our home, which is quite small, really in, in, in floor space in in physical uh, space is just filled with, uh, her imagery and my words. And um, there is a, a kind of symbiotic um, relationship there, I think. I mean, um, it's anyway, that's the way I experience it and I'm very grateful for it. Okay. okay. 
And um, let's see. Uh, what would you say at this point in your, your career as a poet, as just think, thinking about your poetry in terms of what's your, um, who is the most important figure for you to, in your, in your becoming a poet? Like I know, cause I noticed you returned to Williams a lot. I know Williams was very important, but would you, would you put him or would you put Ginsburg or who would you, who would you cite as, as, as that? Uh, you know, just so many, I mean, Williams was tremendously important to me when I was just starting out. And, you know, he, he I lived in New York City. He lived in in, New, in Rutherford, New Jersey, just across the river. And um, so I, you know, had the privilege of getting to know him a bit and, and his crit critiquing my very early, very incipient work. So that was, you know, an extremely important relationship. Whitman, um, Ginsburg, of course, and um, Creeley. And then, you know, when I went to Latin America, um, Vallejo, Cesar Vallejo was just um, really changed my, my way of looking at language. Um, it was uh, a tremendous discovery. And then when I came back to the United States, discovering all of these extraordinary women poets, you know, like Adrian Rich and Audre Lorde and Sonia Sanchez and June Jordan, um, Joy Harjo. I mean, the list is just um, really interminable. Um, and, and the shame of um, having edited a poetry magazine for eight years out of Mexico City and, and not really understanding that so many wonderful women were writing and, you know, um, just weren't getting into print for obvious reasons. So, um, so it's been like waves. Um, and then, you know, there are many influences in my work, which are not other poets, uh, which are visual artists. I have a book coming out in April called Artists in My Life, which is um, a tribute to more than a dozen uh, visual artists who, whose work has been really important to me. Um, and also landscape is incredibly important. Uh, the American Southwest where I live, um, the, the desert, the canyons, the red rocks, um, you know, the space, the, the colors of the desert. Um, so landscape um, and also social struggle. You know, I grew up in a, in a I came, came to, to maturity, I guess you could say, or I came of age um, in an era that was still very much um, uh, influenced by McCarthyism in this country and the, the idea that uh, writers shouldn't write about social issues or what they called political poems, you know, which is a, a phrase that really annoys me um, because I see everything as political and everything as life and everything as, um, as everything. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, for me, it was very fortunate that I moved to, to Latin America in, in, in 1961 and got to read so many uh, Latin American poets who were not who were not burdened by McCarthyism and were writing about everything and anything. And so, you know, I think that um, and, and today I feel that, you know, my my influences are still there and, and they're still coming in and there are new ones. So um, I feel very fortunate in that. I, I just hope that I can be as supportive and um, nurturing of uh, artists and writers coming up as the mentors that I've had in my life. Well, uh, well, I, I will testify that you are. <laughs> um, but uh, well, that that's that gives us a good good hinge into the uh, the book of essays too, because this, as you say, this this question comes up uh, about you know a political poet or a regional poet or some some sort of. Uh, well, you, you seem to class it as it's always a diminishment of poet when you qualify it in any respect. Is that, is that fair? Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's actually an essay in uh, this book of essays called uh, Was Shakespeare a Political Poet? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in that essay, I attempt to um, talk about this issue of, you know, I mean, I think that we very often, and I very often certainly write uh, about political issues, social issues. It's not that, it's that I, uh, 
that label political poet, it especially in this country has been used in such a derogatory way. I mean, it seems to limit the people about whom uh, people are talking, you know, oh, he's a political poet or she's a political poet as if we don't write about anything else. And I mean, I write poems that certainly can be considered political poems, but I also write love poems and I write poems about um, birth and language. And, and I read a great deal about language itself because yeah. it, it's something that fascinates me. So, you know, I, I just, I don't like its limiting um, aspect. <laughs> yeah, even when people mean it as a compliment. You say, like, you know, people, you know, because I, I do think that there's a complimentary intent sometimes because it is it, with with saying that, oh, well, this is a poet who's actually grappling with the issues and is not a quietist poet. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure yeah. that's true that and I'm sure that that most people who use that term don't, you know, intentionally use it derogatorily. Um, but Nevertheless, I feel like it's important to, um, I just don't want to be limited by anybody, by any of these de definitions. You know, I, I would like my work to be seen as larger than any of those sort of um, pat categories. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about the genesis of, the, of thinking about thinking, just because it's a, it's a I, I'm delighted by the volume because it's very much, it's it's very much a poet's book, even though it's it, yeah, it's, it's not a uh, it's not in verse, but it's it's yeah. it's a book you could tell a poet wrote. Well, you know, I've written essays for uh, a long time. I this is probably my sixth or seventh collection of essays, but I think this essay, this book does um, have something different about it because I've been really concerned in. Um, in the last, I'd say, 20 years or so, maybe since um, George W. Bush, um, uh, I've, I've been concerned about the fact that um, critical thinking is really, it's being eliminated from our public uh, education system. Um, my wife was a, a, a middle school teacher for many years, and um, she was actually told in no, no uncertain terms not to teach her students to uh, critically think about things. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that this is, you know, it's, it's call me a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist if you wish, but I really feel that this is intentional and it's uh, very pervasive. And so uh, this book is, is kind of my response to that, you know? And I also think that as a result of that, um, that lack of critical thinking, that lack of, encouraging critical thinking um, in the whole population, not just in young people, uh, what, we, what happens is we become very didactic. You know, the right becomes more rightist, the left becomes more leftist. Um, uh, opinions are expressed that are, um, you know, very absolute. And I think that, they're, that that's a problem. Um, some of the essays in this book, the one about getting rid of statues, for example, the insult, the racist statues, or um, even the one about Me Too, um, their attempts to look at these issues in a more nuanced way, not, um, not a kind of devil's advocate way at all, uh, yeah. because I don't, I don't like that, but um, to understand that, um, things are just not absolute, you know, that there, there does needs to be some nuance in, in, in talking about these issues that are, that are important in our lives. And so I think in that respect that this book is a departure and um, my, my hope is that we'll, it, it will uh, spark some discussions, you know, people who don't agree with me and, and who have other things to say and, and you know that we can have conversations because I think that's lacking in this country. We're so polarized, and um, and it's tearing us apart. Yeah. No, I think I mean there's a couple of things I wanted to leap off of that, but one of them being uh, just the, the whole idea of nuance kind of permeates the book. You know that you're you're wrestling with uh, things, and you say some things that people might not 
want to hear, you know, like uh, just in the in the essay you read, um, you know, you talk about, well, there's a couple of good points about what, about Amazon, you know, or there's certainly useful things mm -hmm. about Amazon, you know, and again, you know, <laughs> everyone hates Amazon, but I, you know, I'd be lying if I said I, I never used it even in the publishing world, you know, because there's, it's a, it's a reference guide a lot of the time if you're looking for uh, comparable titles or you need to find one a date when a book was published or an ISBN, it's all there, you know, and it's like, how, how, you know, that, it's raising and it, it's such a, it's, you know, it's a punching, punching bag of publishing in the book world right now, Amazon. But so I thought, <laughs> thought it was rather brave even to suggest, you know, to go on record that there was a, uh, anything positive about it, you know? Well, I do want to go on record as saying that if you can possibly buy a book from an independent bookseller like City Lights or so many others, that's absolutely what we all need to be doing. I mean, that's, yeah. there's no question about that. Uh, and I hope that I don't, but, you know, I do say a lot of things in this book that I know I will be criticized for. And for some reason, perhaps because of my age, um, it doesn't really matter to me that much anymore. You yeah. know, uh, right now, for example, we have the situation in Nicaragua where um, this dictator and his wife who call themselves Sandinistas are actually, you know, tearing the country apart and uh, imprisoning people, uh, uh, torturing people, killing people. And yet um, so many uh, in the solidarity movement uh, here in this country um, continue to, to defend Nicaragua because um, after all, the United States is supposed to be against Nicaragua. So if the United States is against it, we, we should be for it. And I just think that that represents very shallow thinking and, uh, and, and cowardly thinking, really, because, I mean, you know, we have to really look at the facts on the ground and um, be willing to put ourselves out there and say that there are, um, that there's, there's, there's evidence of uh, authoritarianism that uh, have, has, has got to be criticized. So, you know, I think that, um, I, I just think it's important to, um, to not, you know, I think it's, I guess what I want to say is that one of the failures of my generation, uh, and I very much include myself in this, is following political leaders sort of blindly or religious teachings blindly or any kind of teachings blindly. You know, you admire somebody and so everything they say and do is supposed to be terrific. And um, it's just an oversimplification of life. And I think that in order to really make the changes that we need in this world, and at this point, that means saving life on earth, really. Yeah. Um, we, we need to be, we need to look cl more closely uh, at, at different realities and be willing to say, well, you know, this piece is, is really important from over here, but this piece from over here is important too. And um, I just, I think we, and, and of course that is critical thinking. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I think I didn't invent this or anything, but, um, but um, yeah, I see that in the chat that uh, Joe in, in Boulder says, see abandoning either or, which is uh, one of the essays in the book. So thanks. Yeah. Joe for pointing that out. <laughs> well, this actually brought, brought me back to the other thing that I thought of uh, uh, when you were talk when we first started talking about the book of essays is uh, do you, have people ever been taught in school to critically think? Do you, <laughs> do you think? Yeah. I, oh yeah. yeah I, I'm yeah. curious. I'm, it's a real question. Like, yeah, I mean, I think that in many of the private schools in this country or the experimental uh. schools. Um, they people students are taught to critically think and um, you know I think that um, and that again is points to the the growing class problem in this country where if you have enough money to send uh, your child to you know school that that where the tuition is is so, is so high that most people can't afford it um, they are going to get that kind of an education and uh, if you are 
you know, a working class person or a poor person and, and send your child to public education, um, they're just not going to get that, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it's pretty clear. It, it points to um, a system that is trying to uh, develop, that is developing a leader class, you know, a class of people in control and um, who will make the laws and, and uh, you know, fill the congressional seats and so forth and so on. And the rest of them, the rest of us are pawns in a system. But I taught for nine years at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, a liberal arts college. And uh, we did, we were encouraged to teach our, our students to think critically. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I say it just because like, you know, I had actually what I think was a good grammar school education. It was Catholic school, you know, so it was, was private, but it was a sort of inner city Catholic school in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And, but I don't, <laughs> I feel like I got the tools to learn how to think there. I don't feel like they wanted me to critically think necessarily. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the only, that's why I, it just struck me to ask that. I also would like to say, you know, just in this, in this conversation that I, I recognize and acknowledge and honor the many, many public school teachers who, uh, you know, do teach critical thinking despite everything. And um, many of them get fired for it. Yeah. I, remember, I remember here in Albuquerque, we uh, during the Iraq War, the first Iraq War, uh, or American War in Iraq, uh, we had four teachers, high school teachers, who um, they weren't even teaching one side or another. They asked their students to uh, discuss the war uh, instead of saying, you know, the, the war is patriotic and wonderful and so forth. And the four of them got got fired for that. Jeez. Yeah. You know, I'm sure that that was repeated in many communities across the country. So it's not just, um, you know, private schools or Catholic schools where um, you have more leeway. I mean, you do have more leeway, but uh, I just want to honor the public school teachers who who do their best to uh, bring that into the public education as well. Okay. Um Peter, were there questions that came in from the uh, from from the chat that, that you wanted to pose? Or yeah, yeah. Um, so Ed asks if you could talk about the different approaches you take to different types of writing, poems, memoir, essays, oral history. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Thank you, Ed. And um, Ed, by the way. Um, wrote a wonderful introduction for my forthcoming book, Artists in My Life. Um, so thank you for that as well. Um, I, you know, I, I was taught, I, I studied in public school all my life. Um, I only went through high school and just a semester of college. So I don't have a tremendous, um, you know, formal education, but um, I um, really grew up hating poetry because it was so badly taught in, in, the schools where I studied, uh, we were just, you know, taught to memorize and so forth, uh, The Raven by Poe or Longfellow or, and so, you know, I never felt that poetry had anything to do with my life. And it wasn't until I was, I don't know, I think 20 or 21 that I was uh, at a party one night and someone read Howell, it was in 1956. And, uh, you know, it had just been published by City Lights and, um, Hearing that poem just, you know, turned me around completely uh, in terms of poetry. And it wasn't that I, you know, that I felt like I had that much in common with Ginsburg. Uh, it was that he was speaking in a way that was so real and so uh, oppositional to the hypocrisy of the 50s uh, that I was living in, that um, I understood for the first time that, that poetry uh, could speak for me and I could speak through poetry. And then, you know, I became very uh, interested in oral history when I was um, in Mexico and, and Cuba and, um, you know, the women's movement had exploded and feminism um, suddenly was explaining a lot of things to me that I didn't understand before. And so I was eager to, you know, interview women and, and uh, in different places in Cuba and Nicaragua, in Peru, in Vietnam, uh, 
and find out how their societies were treating them. Um, and then, you know, essays, because I just, you know, I'm the type of person that's always trying to pick an argument or, or, uh, or, or a conversation, you know, have a conversation. And then very, very recently, just this past year, I suddenly found myself writing short stories for the first time. And before I knew it, I had a book of short stories. So I think that um, it's hard for me, I guess, to answer your question explicitly and to, to say, you know, why I would choose, for example, one form and not another uh, to say whatever it is that I want to say. But I think that one just has the feeling, you know, that sometimes a poem is the perfect vehicle. Sometimes an essay is, is required. Um, obviously, oral history is, you know, when you're dealing with other people's voices and other people's stories, and that's a whole other issue with its own set of ethics and so forth. And then, um, you know, I guess that I've never, I've never really been successful at writing a novel or, or a play. Um, and I admire people who, who are able to master those forms. But um, I guess for me, it's just perhaps the, the, the topic um, that seems to, to say to me, you know, I need to be in a poem or I need to be uh, in a story or an essay. Almost like the the form declares itself rather than you deciding. Yeah, and I yeah. think that form and content are very much of a piece. So for me, so uh, I think you know that that and and then I, I I haven't even spoken about translation. I I just see Louise Popkin up here, uh, who I admire so much as a translator, and and I've done a lot of translating, and that too is an art form, and it's not you know just transcribing from one language into another. It's really recreating um, the novel or the story or the poem in, in a whole different culture, not just a different language, but a different culture. So I think all of these forms, these genres have their, um, their characteristics. And sometimes uh, one set of characteristics is, you know, seems to be the right one for whatever I'm saying. This is like a good segue into the next question. Carmen asks, what were the effects of Latin American culture and literature on your poetics? Tremendous, Carmen. And Carmen, of course, is the great editor of uh, Ediciones Moneda in Chile, uh, who uh, the publishing house that just published this book. Our, um, our launch is gonna be on the 15th of uh, this month. So um, watch my Facebook page for uh, the uh, coordinates for that. But Carmen, uh, it was extremely important for me to uh, move to Mexico in 1961 and to come in contact, not just with another language, but a whole other continent of many, many languages. Because of course, now we understand that there are hundreds of uh, indigenous languages that are not just oral, but also written in Latin America. And um, and then there's Afro-Caribbean poetry and Afro-Brazilian poetry. So, um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was what I mentioned before, that coming from the United States that was still really under the, the, um, the weight of, of McCarthyism, that suddenly I came in contact with poets who were writing about everything and I didn't feel that that, that stigma if they wanted to write about something um, social or political. So, um, so that was one thing that was very important to me. And then another thing I think was just that Spanish is a very different language from English and it has its own enormous um, set of, of characteristic sounds and music and uh, ways of describing things and so, you know, that just broadened my, um, my, my vision of what it was to be a writer and to be a poet. Well, thank Margaret for, for being here and for being a, uh, a constant source of inspiration for everything, everything you've done, Margaret. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud and happy to know you.
Uh, thank you. I feel the same about you, Garrett. And thank you to City Lights. Thank you, uh, Peter. Please, please support your independent bookstores and tonight in a special uh, support uh, City Lights. You know, I'm sure that I don't have to say this, but City Lights has been around for decades. It's probably one of the oldest continuing, um, continually operating bookstores uh, in the country. Peter, you can you can uh, tell me I'm wrong if that's not true. And uh, Peter just told me before we sort of went live tonight that um, uh, the store is open in reduced hours from noon to eight at night. Is that it? And um, so you know that's uh, something that is great for the San Francisco community, but uh, or the Bay Area. But uh, books can also be ordered uh, online from City Lights. So it's really important to keep our our independent bookstores going. Um, I I meant what I said in my essay that it's kind of like a last line of defense for thinking and creating and 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 listening to what other people are creating and thinking. Uh, it's, it's just so important not to be boxed in by this corporate culture that um, is really trying to produce a nation of people who will buy their goods and up their profits. You know, that's what it amounts to. So thank you for having me again.